welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Marcus Howard from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And it's great to see so many familiar faces, but also a lot of new faces as well. So um, I'm just starting proceedings. It looks like it's all settled now. So it's um, a couple of things. Uh, just housekeeping first is the mobile phones. If you could just all turn them to silent so that it doesn't disturb the proceedings this morning. And um, the emergency procedures for the, conf for the convention centre, it is quite a large building and there are a lot of staff around to help in the event of emergency. But they have asked me just to say that in the event of an emergency, there'll be a, a two-stage warning. The second stage is, is something you can't miss when it goes whoop, whoop, whoop. And you then proceed as directed by the staff to the emergency, <coughs> emergency exits. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce uh, my colleague, Julianne Cowley. Um, Julianne is the Assistant Secretary of the Health and Water Branch at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Julianne previously worked in human resources, partnerships policy, and for the Parliamentary Secretary for International Development Bob McMullen, who a number of you might remember from our Melbourne conference, uh, was, was one of our speakers and was a long-term supporter of the WASH sector. For several years, Julianne also worked for the Prime Minister's Community Business Partnership. But prior to that involvement in community, in international development, Julianne worked in, indig in Indigenous education and has completed a Master's in Business Administration, Diploma in Education, Bachelor of Communications, and as an accredited partnership broker. Julianne was also a founding board member of the IU Foundation in Chiang Rai, Vice President on the Board of Lifeline Canberra, and was an advisor for several years with Canteen, which supports young people living with cancer. She's also studied business education, commerce, and is an accredited partnership broker. And also saw in her qualifications, she has a music qualification too, but she might share that later on in terms of <laughs> what part, of, what type of music as well. So um, I'd like you to welcome Julianne. Thank you for that um, welcome, Marcus. Yes, lucky there's not a piano on the stage. Um, I, it's my privilege to be here this morning and to welcome you to the 2016 WASH Futures Conference. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I extend that as a very warm welcome to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues here with us today. It will be my pleasure uh, shortly to introduce uh, a welcome to country, um, but I, I get to make a few remarks just before that. Um, I also would like to welcome the distinguished guests and delegates that we have with us today, and it is an impressive audience. Uh, Vice Minister Hong Tang Tung, thank you very much for coming. The Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Vietnam. Mr. Tanvir Aslam, Provincial Minister of Housing in Punjab State, Pakistan. The Honourable Na Badu Chan from Nepal Legislature. Zachary S. Philippe, Mayor of Kuamba, Mozambique. The Mayor of Makassar from Dr. Mohamed Ramdan Pomanto. Manuel Antonio Acolete Lopez Duarajo, Mayor of Kuala Main, Mozambique. Their government representatives. Katerina de Albuquerque from the uh, Sanitation and Water for All. Our long-term partners, World Health Organisation, UNICEF, World Bank, ADB, and Australia awardees. Of course, everyone else that is with us today and our partners from the WASH Futures Committee, the WASH Reference Group, and the International Water Centre. Um, it is certainly a room filled with experiences and expertise. So thank you for coming together. It's great that we're here in Brisbane, and I think Queensland provides a really interesting context for our conversation in water. 
And when I think about the Sustainable Development Goals and the Millennium Development Goals, it occurred to me that there is this one fundamental difference, and that is that the Sustainable Development Goals are universal. So they have messages and challenges for developed countries as well as developing countries. And Australia has water challenges, as you're aware. Queensland is a perfect example. We have parts of this state that is in long, dry drought, and we are meeting in a city which not too long ago flooded, and it's changed the nature of this city to a, a sustainable a place that is very conscious of how they're going to manage water going forward. Professor Henrietta Moore from the University College in London, um, I heard describe the challenges in the, the wash sector in, in a nice way that resonated with me. And she talked about it being a one in three problem. That 2.3 billion people in our world have no access to adequate sanitation. That's one in three in our world's population. One in three people have no access to a toilet. One in three of all schools globally lack access to safe water and sanitation. And one in three of all healthcare facilities in low and middle income countries also lack access to safe water and sanitation. So the problem, as you all know, is great. I wanted to take a chance the, this morning to talk about two ideas very quickly, but that of stories and partnerships. As Marcus said, um, one of my passions is, is certainly this idea of working in partnership. But to take stories first, my three-year-old son knows the importance of stories because every night when I go to put him to bed, he says, books, mummy, books, and I read books and books and books. And then after that, he says, books, daddy, books, and he reads books and books and books. And I think this is because even he knows that stories are the way to learn. And so when we think about development and the challenges are complex, it's really important to think about stories for us to share and learn, to know what has been successful and what has failed, to find platforms to communicate and share each other's stories and listen. And that's what I think this conference provides us the opportunity to do today. So I thought I would start with a very quick story and it will be one that's familiar to all of you, I'm sure. Um, just a reminder of the historical story of Dr. John Snow back in the 1850s. And it's that fundamental story where a doctor had an idea that cholera was a waterborne disease. But that was against the, the popular belief at the time that it was airborne. And Dr. John Snow was able to use the recently uh, available death data that had been collected for about 10 years prior to look at where the cholera deaths were happening. And it was congregated around one pump on Broad Street in Soho. But he had a problem because two of the deaths weren't from that area. It was an aunt and a niece that lived somewhere out. And so as a good researcher, he actually went the extra mile, literally went out, met with the son, sat down with the grieving family and talked to them for a while and actually found out that, of course, she grew up in Soho, liked the taste of the water and had it brought to her weekly. And so her and the niece had drunk the contaminated water and that's what led to the demise. So with all this knowledge, he was able to effect immediate change, convince people to take away the handle of the pump. And the epidemic of cholera in the 1850s dried up almost immediately. Well, I guess I remind you of that story this morning for a couple of reasons, because I think we need to be very clear that the issues in WASH that we're talking about are linked incredibly closely to disease and death when, it doesn't, when we don't get it right. That vulnerable systems in water and sanitation lead to huge human impact. And too often this sector, I think others outside it, think about these issues in isolation from basic health. That 2.4 million deaths could be prevented each year if people had access to a toilet, practiced good hygiene and sanitation and had clean water. 2.4 million. I heard one report that talked about it as being a forgotten foundation in basic health, thinking of the idea that it's something governments do and people receive with little consultation. And we know that when that happens, bad investment also happens. Which leads me to my second point of partnerships. I'm conscious that years of investment, very smart people, effort 
billions of dollars has all gone into development in particular these kind of challenges and yet the big challenges still remain these amazing goal of sustainable development six to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all so i believe what needs to be different in the next generation is working in partnership and i'm talking about cross-sector partnerships so communities sitting down with indigenous people and certainly in our country Indigenous people have an ancient knowledge of land and water. Sitting down with civil society, with private sector, universities, local governments, all sorts of different interest groups to firstly share stories. And secondly, to bring their unique perspectives together to work in new approaches. And when partnerships are set up in a unique way, you can actually harness the self-interests of some of those groups, um, particularly private sector. And I think that's a, a really, it's, it's not easy, but I think it's a really unique way to bring scalability and sustainability to some of the challenges that we're thinking about. Finally, I just wanted to talk briefly about the CS Wash Fund, which I know will be very familiar to a lot of you in the room, but it is something that we're very proud of at DFAT. And I've been inspired by the level of creativity and commitment in hearing about the work that's happening in the fund. We're only halfway through this uh, particular initiative and already over half a million people have access to improved sanitation facility. Over half a million additional people are living in households where water is treated safely and stored safely. And 1.3 million people have increased knowledge of hygiene practices. Sometimes I tend to get lost in those big figure numbers, 1.3 million and half a million, but each of those is one person whose life has been improved because of the work of, that people are doing. The projects aren't just considering water issues. We know to, to have this kind of level of success, we're talking about health, gender equity, gender-based violence, disability inclusiveness, physical, physical, mental health, general wellbeing, cultural behaviour and norms, a whole range of things that need to be considered to come into that sustainable development. So I congratulate everyone involved in those inspiring projects. And before I finish, I'd like to thank the conference organisers today. This is the fourth time that this sector has come together for the WASH conference. Um, and that's due to the work of the WASH reference group, the International Water Centre. And I must say that I'm very proud to work alongside my colleagues at DFAT, Marcus, Anne and their team have done a great job. I hope the next few days offer you the chance to build networks but more importantly, to tell stories. I'd ask you to please be generous in sharing your knowledge and your experience and listen to those who are with you today. The theme of the conference is futures and it's a privilege to be in a room filled with passionate people, dedicated people who are all thinking about the future. And I wish you all the luck in the world continuing to work to achieve the incredibly important goal of water and sanitation for all. Thank you. Now on to uh, something that I'm very excited about, so our um, welcome to country and we are very privileged today to be joined by Songwoman Maruchi, who is a songwoman and lawwoman of the Turbal people, the original inhabitants of Brisbane. She's a direct descendant of Daka Yaka, the chief of Old Brisbane tribe, a man who is nicknamed the Duke of York by European settlers in Moreton Bay area in the early 1830s. She's the first Aboriginal Dramatics Art graduate of the Victorian College of the Arts in Melbourne, a renowned opera singer, and was the first Australian to perform at the United Nations in New York in 1993 in honour of the International Year of the World's Indigenous Peoples. I'm personally very excited um, to have her join us today. She is going to perform a traditional blessing of this gathering in accordance with the Turbal traditional laws and customs. She's also going to be joined by Bruce McLean, who's born in Brisbane and a didgeridoo performer for the Nalinyalu Aboriginal Dance Group. With over 15 years of performing arts experience, Bruce has developed a unique style of playing the didgeridoo. He's performed with the Waka Waka Dance Group and many other Aboriginal groups within Southeast Queensland region. So I thank you very much for your time and give them a warm welcome. Balam di ko kundu numbuler, balam di ko kundu numbuler, yang indai, yang go kundai, yang go 
Ballen die go, kondom dum bele. 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 Jan in die, Jan go, kondom die, Jan go. Ballen die go, kondom dum bele. Balam di ko kundul numbule. Bulkairi marumba kuripanu. Let's welcome to this South Bank of Brisbane, South Brisbane, in the language of the Turubu people, when we do welcome to country ceremony. As already been said, it's done as a blessing of the gathering and a song, and I shall do that in a tinchy while. But um, <coughs> firstly, I'd li um, just uh, like to add a little bit more to. The introduction of my nephew here is actually my sister's son. Um, Bruce is um, also a custodian of the, and it's very important in Aboriginal tradition, of the, um, the eclipse of the sun song lines. So uh, that came down through the generations to him. So um, I feel uh, very blessed to have him with me today. So I'll do the blessing and um, hope you have a wonderful conference. The song I was just singing was the uh, Brisbane River Dreaming. Um, at the end of the um, blessing, we will also uh, perform a sunrise song together.
Thank you. I think that was, um, if anything illustrates Australia, it's the didgeridoo, but I think um, this morning the, the singing um, was uh, very heartfelt and, and inspiring. So it's now my pleasure to um, introduce Barbara Evans as the conference facilitator. <coughs> Barbara, who I'm sure a lot of you either know or have heard of or, or have met before, holds the Chair in Public Health Engineering in the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds. She has a long research background which is centred on sanitation, hygiene and water services in the Global South. Professor Evans's research includes sanitation, in low-income urban communities, rural sanitation, and water and sanitation in cities and towns. After graduating in civil engineering, it's always good to welcome another civil engineer to the stage. Um, Barbara worked in Sudan, Pakistan, and India before taking a master's in development studies. But Barbara's also worked with our long-term partners in the World Bank's water and sanitation program in South Asia and in Washington. She joined the University of Leeds in 2009 and is now program leader for the Master of Science in Water, Sanitation and Health, or WASH Engineering. Professor en Evans has worked extensively on the monitoring of the water-related MDGs and is now on the monitoring group for SDG6 and chairs the strategic advisory group of UNICEF, WHO, the Joint Monitoring Plan Program. Barbara's got a bright disposition, but she's also a hard taskmaster, so you can look forward to Barbara keeping us on track over the next couple of days. But we're very pleased to welcome Barbara and that thank her for travelling such a long way to help us facilitate and, and keep this uh, conference energised. Welcome. Not so easy. Thanks, Marcus. That's Were you sure that's me? Didn't sound like me. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know about me coming a long way, but thank you all for coming such a long way. Although, uh, I hope you'll all agree with me that Brisbane's put on a kind of show of excellent weather for us. So, uh, you know, we should all be glad to be here. Oh, I seem to be... Should I step forward? Is that okay? Uh, right, so I thought it would just be nice to find out where people have come from, uh, just to see who's in the room. Now, this room isn't a great room for this, so you're going to have to do a couple of things. I hope you all take yoga lessons or Pilates, because this whole exercise is going to require you to turn around quite a lot. So the first thing I'm going to do is point out some important people. Most important people to start with are the conference committee. Now, why are the conference committee important? It's because if anything goes wrong, it's entirely their fault. <laughs> Nothing to do with me, it's entirely their fault. And for the purposes of things going wrong, I'm not a member of the committee. So if I could just ask the members of the committee to stand up, you can mark them well. Come on, chaps. Lead by example. Um, and I would like to say this is the most fantastic group of people to work with. They're just so positive and so nice particularly when it's 7 o'clock in the UK and I'm in my pyjamas and it's 5 o'clock in Melbourne and they're all having a glass of wine. They're particularly cheery people to work with. Okay, so let's see who's in the room. So how many people here are either Australian or live and work in Australia? And you will have to stand up and you will have to look around. So let's see all the Australians in the room. Yay, excellent. So... I'd like to congratulate you all on nearly winning the Eurovision Song Contest. Good effort. As a British person, I'm really, really secretly delighted that you didn't quite win. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so who's here from the Pacific region? Specifically Pacific region islanders. Come on, I know you're here. Up you get. Excellent, thank you. Look around and see who's here. Uh, Excellent. Uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia. So some of those will overlap, I'm thinking. Wow. Wow. So that's quite a big group. You guys could take on the Australians in Rugby Sevens, I'm thinking, because uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of you. 
Uh, specifically within that group, because I probably confused you, South Asia. So people that live or work or are South Asian, because I spotted a few. There we go. <laughs> Welcome. So South Asia is my spiritual home. I lived in Pakistan and India for nearly 18 years, so I'm going to hang with those guys. Um, oh, let me see. Where should we go next? Africa. Let's see who's here from Africa, from the beautiful continent. Well done. So thank you. So you guys have come quite a long way. Uh, North Africa, the Middle East. I'm not sure we actually have anybody. Anybody from North Africa? The Levant? I think not. Okay, so we've got a gap. We must make a note. We must sort that out next time. Okay, everybody who is either a European or who lives and works in Europe. So some of you will be standing up several times. So Europeans, all up you get. Very good. That's me too. Welcome, welcome. Very good. Uh, North America, you guys have come a really long way. A few North Americans. These guys are pretty hardy. Let's give them a big clap. And Central and Southern America. Yay! Well done, guys. Very good. So they're a pretty small group, so we kind of got to be nice to them, okay? So just make sure they're okay. That's good. Uh, who have I forgotten? I think... Has anybody not stood up? I mean, not just because you don't feel like standing up, but because I haven't called out your name. Okay, no, you're all good. Right, okay, so now I've got... Oh, and where are you from? Uh, Mongolia. Mongolia. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. That's Central Asia. Anybody else? From Central Asia. Oh. So you've just pipped the, the South Americans for, for, for kudos for being on your own. So we all have to be very nice. Right now I have a very special group. Okay. This is quite a tricky group. Listen carefully. If you live, work, or come from Thailand, Algeria, Jamaica, Germany, Switzerland, Croatia, Italy, or Tunisia. Can you please stand up? Okay. That's very good. Plus, anybody from Leicester in the UK? That's me. Okay. Yay! So, here's a quiz for all you Australians. Why are these people important? Why are those countries really important? Does anyone know? Say it louder. All connected somehow with Leicester City. All connected somehow with Leicester City. And, and what did Leicester City do this year? Yes. Very good. Thank you very much, my Leicester team. Thank you very, very much. I must confess to you that I was wearing my Leicester City shirt in Singapore Airport, because sadly I do have one. And a lady from Thailand did come up to me and embrace me and thank me. And I'm not actually really from Leicester. I'm just married into a Leicester family. Thank you very much for gratifying me.